That is running. Cool. Perfect. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh welcome to this week's this this uh yeah, this week's webinar. Uh this week's webinar topic will be uh, a recap on the Locks on Product Conference 2024. Um having an overview of what products and features we brought out. Um and here to kind of answer your questions if you've got any about them. Um and a few examples that you can put some of these products into practice. Uh, so, of course, if you don't know already, my name is Cameron, um, and I will be your host today. So our agenda, firstly, of the so we've got four things we're going to discuss, four kind of categories. Um, that's going to start off with uh, locks on Exosphere um, and locks on Config 15. We're going to look at the energy meter tree. Uh, and also the master client lineup of products. So we'll start off with uh, locks on config 15 and then work our way through. I've got the chat open here. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and I'll try and cover them as and when. If not, we'll do a short Q&A at the end as well. So let's get cracking. Locks on config 15. Locks on config 15, as you know, we're bringing out new versions of config on a yearly basis um, and in between maybe two to four times a year having some minor revisions with more features as well. But mainly with Locks on Config 15, this is bringing a few key features to the fleet. So firstly, DALI 2 bringing, coming across to the DALI extension. So with this, uh, with this certification in mind, this means that you are no longer just using the DALI extension for light, uh, DALI light fittings. Uh, but this also opens up the portfolio of DALI inputs. So if there's a requirement for, I don't know, a, a DALI PIR, if you're retrofitting, or um, a DALI, a, a, another DALI peripheral, you can now use that with the DALI extension, uh, exactly like the uh, DALI Air. Now, of course, we'd love you to use the, the present sensors, the touch pure flexes, etc. But of course, there's going to be those occasions where there's a peripheral required, and there's a very strict parameter for that peripheral. So in the justice setting, there could be uh, a PIR that's required. But in those settings, you need to make sure that certain safety aspects are taken into consideration, where there may already be a DALI peripheral for exactly that purpose, and it's a very niche market. So for Loxon to make a PIR specifically for that market, it wouldn't necessarily make sense. But there's a great product on the market already, so let's integrate it with the DALI extension. All existing DALI extensions will receive a firmware update to support DALI 2, but they won't have the official certification. They won't get like a, a thumbs up or a label to say DALI 2 because they're already installed in the field. And because up until this point we haven't supported it, it's probably not going to make any difference. You'll notice at the moment that the, the DALI extension, I think, is is low stock or out of stock. It will become back in stock, and that's just because of the hardware revision to make it DALI 2 certified, which will be back in stock in the next month or so. Um, so that's DALI 2. That's pretty much all there is to it. Um, no pun intended. And then we have uh, audio history. So back in, I think, 14.7, we announced the new feature of like the, the history. So if you have a lighting controller that's on and you want to see why it's on, whether that's somebody's tapped the switch, somebody's walked into the room, somebody's manually controlled that function block from the app, it will tell you exactly why that function block has got that specific behavior. I.e. if I changed the lighting mood in the app to a custom setting, it would specifically say Cameron changed the lighting to a custom mood. Um, and this can also now be brought to audio as well so you'll be able to understand exactly why certain behaviors are happening which is definitely useful for the likes of climate control or automatic shading and of course lighting and audio and i'm sure more function blocks will join that in the future um, we've then got authentication parameter for the nfc code touch now the authentication authentication parameter always existed on the nfc code touch However, it wasn't something you could dynamically change. It was something that you could just choose between uh, within uh, configuring the function block and then it's set. So you wouldn't then be able to change it unless you go back into locks on config. So the different authentication settings we have for 
uh, the function block is NFC. We've then got a code. And then finally, we have got uh, two-step authentication. So you need a code and an NFC tag or, or an NFC tag and a code. It doesn't matter which way. Now, in some instances, it may be necessary to just use codes or just use NFC tags. So here at Loxon, we, within our buildings, our, our offices, we've just got NFC tags because now that we've got over 650 employees, it's very easy for somebody to want to use the same access code. So by sticking to NFC tags, you won't have that issue. But let's say, for example, you had an office environment where you wanted to allow general access throughout the day with an NFC code touch with an NFC tag or an NFC card. But outside of business hours, if somebody wants to enter the office, they want th there was a requirement to use two-step authentication, then the NFC code touch can now enable this. So this input isn't just on and off because of course you're changing between code only, NFC only, or allow both or two-step authentication. There is various different parameters you can use. So depending on the time of day, you could dynamically change that using something like the schedule function block. The schedule function block isn't just on and off, it's also got an analog output. So you can define during different intervals, say let's have the output of number one and let's say that that's only NFC. Don't know them off my off by heart. Um, the next function block that's had a, a major revision would be the wallbox function block. Now, of course, we know that we brought out the wallbox, uh, the, the, the new wallbox back in 2020, uh, at the end of, sorry, 2022. Um, and when we brought out the new wallbox, we also revised the function block. And that, of course, brought a whole wealth of new features. But with the function block now, um, as we've as we've developed the, um, the wall box, et cetera, and it's been out in market, we've also seen the need for additional inputs. So we've now got the ability to dynamically change the price. So you were initially just defining the name of the, the charging mode and what the limit for charging was. Maybe that's 11, 7.4, 3.7, or 1.4 kilowatts. Um, or it could be variable from the... Uh, energy uh, manager, but you may also need to variably change the price of charging if you're doing billing on the fly. Perhaps spot price uh, or a dynamic tariff is necessary. Um, and now we've got input, so you can change the price of the charging session by using inputs. You can set prices for each mode and they could be different. You can dynamically change them and of course, with the manual mode, you can also define a different price if you wanted to. You don't have to dynamically change them. You can just set them once and leave it be and you're all good. With the wallbox manager, so this kind of ties in with the wallbox naturally. This is there to make sure that if there is, let's say we had 7.4 kilowatt uh, available and we allowed to, we were going to give it to um, a bank of wallboxes. But let's say that one of the wall boxes kind of took that 7.4 kilowatts because that was the only car plugged in. But let's say now another car plugged in and wanted to start charging. Because that initial 7.4 kilowatt has already been taken, it wouldn't then be split and shared across the second wall box. However, now this is a feature of the wall box manager to make sure that that allowed power is available between everyone who's using it. Um, then we have the energy flow monitor. So a few more improvements there, making sure that all of the statistics and the graphs um, and the kind of flow of, of power and energy is correct, of course, as it should be. Um, and more responsive as well. You can go into more detail. Up until this point, you weren't able to select the, um, to, you won't be able to, generate statistics for the other category. Now, other is however much you're generating, however much you're pulling from the grid. If you aren't monitoring and I think that's your other category, that's what your building is consuming. Whereas now you can click on it, you can see the details, the statistics, so you can kind of understand at what time of day you've got those, uh, those peaks, but also what that base load is. And of course, 
exosphere. So then we'll get onto that in just a moment. But exosphere is there for a it's it's a much larger product or service that we're now offering. Um, but exosphere is fully integrated within Loxon Config, so you can get the meter information or any statistics that you want from your mini server or kind of any information you want from your mini server exosphere gives you that and we'll look at that in just a moment now a few more extra features so we've got uh, the health check the health check was introduced a few versions ago but we've now included audio into this as well so it will check all the different factors relating to audio uh, really beneficial as well We've got the, uh, like I mentioned, the Warbox uh, improvements and the Warbox manager. We have the NFC code touch improvement. Also with the uh, inputs. So with inputs, you were never able to invert them themselves. You would have to invert the function block. Whereas now you can invert the input itself. So it kind of re removes the necessary not function block, for example, or inverting the uh, input. So let's say you had three door and window contacts. One of them was normally closed, one was normally open. You would have to have a lot of not function blocks instead of just inverting the one input. And now you can do that. Seems simple, but definitely um, a notable addition. And then uh, we've got the addition of the mathematical function blocks, which at the moment is just average, add, multiply, and min, max. Other mathematical function blocks I'm sure will join down the line. But with those other mathematical function blocks like subtract and uh, divide, you've got more complex equations to take into consideration. So it's not just uh, plug and play. So we've got to keep that in mind. And we need to make sure we don't adapt anything that's already in the field. Um, so what's now changed is that you can drag, uh, let's say we have three values. We can connect that to one input and it will see all three values and automatically, in the, in the case of the average function block, average them all together before you would have to connect them to three individual inputs. Now, you may be thinking, I'll just connect them to the three individual inputs. And don't worry, I've got you covered for this answer. The, what, with this one, this is primarily designed for if you need more than the limit of four. So if you need to add more than four inputs together, or sorry, or average more than four inputs together, you would then need to have another average function block and average those two average function blocks together gets very complicated. You now don't need to do that. And same with the add function block. We've got the add, the two-way add function block versus the four-way add function block. You can now do it all in one function block. It's a lot of function blocks. And of course, most importantly, more than 150 bug fixes as well. And we can only thank everyone who uses locks on config on a day-to-day -day basis for helping us with finding those bugs and resolving them ultimately. So that's pretty much locks on config 15. If you've got any questions, you're more than welcome to pop them in the chat. We've had one already. Uh, is there a limit to the number of inputs you can connect? Nope, you can connect as many as you want to the input um, without any issues at all. So Exosphere. Exosphere is our next product uh, that, we're go that we, we are now offering. Now, there was a definite need for this as we grew from the small residential uh, sector into the, the larger commercial sector. Because in commercial sectors, you've got, of course, dramatically bigger buildings, potentially multiple of them. Data analysis suddenly becomes more important. Data retention becomes more important. And comparing and generating reports is also a vital part. And this is exactly what Exosphere delivers. Exosphere was also designed for a few different uh, people. Of course, as Loxon partners, you may have several, um, like, uh, several mini servers out there in the field, whether that be across one site or multiple sites, and managing them, especially uh, at scale, can potentially become quite difficult, perhaps doing it all from the Loxon app and accidentally enabling notifications every time your customer's burglar alarm goes off accidentally or, I don't know, their touch and grill timer goes off, you're getting notifications, which isn't ideal. So having a centralized platform which isn't intrusive is really beneficial. So that's exactly what Exosphere does. So as a Loxon partner, you can back up your systems, you can update them, and get all the vital information like system status messages all in one platform. 
Then you've got your more power users where data analysis is really important. Now, this could be a homeowner who wants to compare their uh, energy usage year on year or different temperature readings, um, or they may have multiple um, mini servers in their in their home or their residence. That is an option. Whereas with your more commercial scale, where there are multiple buildings or multiple mini servers within the building that you need to have an overview of and compare data, that's what Exosphere is designed for. So let's have a take a quick look and break it down into what is um, kind of Exosphere is offering. So we'll break it down instead of going straight into everything. So we'll start off with the mini server monitoring, the automated backups, the scheduled updates, and the document management. So this is primarily designed for you as a Loxon partner, fleet management. So mon managing your fleet of, of mini servers. So of course your mini server monitoring, system status messaging, messages, making sure that everything is all tickety-boo with no issues at all. Um, and if there is something, it pops up and hopefully you spot it before the customer does and you can be proactive with any maintenance necessary. Scheduled updates. Of course, we recommend that updates, every system runs the latest release version of Loxon Config so that it can benefit from the latest features and also any potential bug fixes or issues that the, we were facing. And scheduled updates ultimately remove that pressure from you. What's really great about the scheduled updates is it's not like updating your mini server remotely. Now, of course, you're not physically on site, but updates nowadays is nothing to be afraid of. No issues really happen. But what's different is instead of your computer sending the update file over the internet to your mini server, and then potentially there being issues across the internet, what will happen is the mini server gets a command from Exosphere to say, right, we're going to do an update. The mini server then downloads that update file from the internet, of course, and make sure everything's all good before it then installs it. And then if, any, if it detects that anything may be wrong, it will notify you and not install the update and to ultimately not cause any catastrophic issues. Now, scheduled updates doesn't mean that it's going to update like tomorrow with the latest release version if we released a new one. You'll notice with all of the locks on release updates, they never instantly go online as a automatic update. You'll find that we release it potentially in March and then in June, it may become available as an automatic update. So once we feel it's ready to go out into the field, we've had great feedback from partners, et cetera. Now, scheduled updates can then say, okay, we're great. We've got that automatic update ready. Now let's automatically update our mini servers at a specific time on a specific day. We're all good. Next, we've got document management. So with document management, you've got um, cases where when you're doing a project, we have cable schedules, designs, um, config files. We've got so much different, so many different documents that you're going to want to store. Now, this could be in paper form. This could be on an online platform like Google Drive or OneDrive or SharePoint or whatever. Exosphere now gives you one location to manage your mini servers, but also put all the documents relating to those projects in one location. Now, with document management, you may be thinking, well, cable schedules and other design files are coming much before the installed mini server, which is true. So as long as you have a mini server serial number, you don't actually need to have it installed. So your mini server serial number, let's say you've purchased the mini server or you've got one on the shelf that you you know this is the one for Joe Blogs. You can add this serial number to Exosphere without giving a license or connecting it to the internet or anything. You add it to Exosphere and you can then upload documents to Exosphere for that project. And then once that project is commissioned and installed and online, Exosphere is already ready to start backing up the mini server or updating it if necessary. And you can start gathering data from it. So quite a great feature. Then we've got backups. Now with backups, backups from Exosphere can be done manually. So you can just at a click of a button, back up the mini server. Then if you need to download it and maybe create a, a backup copy of an SD card, perhaps that's, po that's completely possible from Exosphere. 
if you want to create automated backups, so on a daily basis, a weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis, or on demand, you can as well. We'll get into the licensing and how that works in just a moment, but that's also possible. Okay, now we have the next part. So we have cloud storage. Now, of course, Luxon's always very much been all your data is on your mini server and it's not in the cloud. And it's really important to make sure that everyone knows that Exosphere is an opt-in service. The reason why Exosphere was delivered and, and, and made is because of the demand on the market for those larger scale projects. But it's not vital to share your data with Exosphere. If you need to expand the cloud storage for your document management or config files, etc., you can with no problem at all. We've then got task management and task boards. So let's say your mini server gave you a system status message to say a battery was a low in a touch pure perhaps on a customer site. The system status was a message would come up at 15%. And we still know that we've got a good few weeks or months before we need to change that battery. But we can now use Exosphere to schedule our work schedule um, and our workload and make sure that that battery is replaced in adequate time so there's no downtime on the system. So from that system status message, you can select create task or new task. You can assign it to a team member, you can select the severity and you can detail exactly what the device is, et cetera. So really, really beneficial. Um, so of course, alerts kind of ties in with the task boards and the mini server monitoring. The task list, so collaborative, you could have assigned tasks to individuals. You could have a pool of tasks. So once somebody's completed their workload, they can then access it uh, from a pool of, of tasks that need to be done. And that's ultimately up to you that you can manage. Then the final part, which is the more power user part of Exosphere and, and um, the kind of the, the game changing part is the data analysis sector. Now with this, we can import charts, system schematics, analyze data from different mini servers altogether, and also import statistical uh, hi history, hist excuse me, hist historical statistics into uh, Exosphere. So up until this point, you could have been generating statistics for energy and temperature or blow rates, all sorts. And now you want to bring it into Exosphere and kind of compare data, generate reports, etc. This can be done when you create a graph or when you create um, a chart, this can be done straight away. So it will automatically import all of the history all into um, your Exosphere platform. Um, now, this is also, again, something we'll discuss with the uh, the licensing pack factor of who gets this feature and who doesn't. Um, and then we have the system schematics. Now, system schematics is something we've had for a long time um, in the Loxon app and within Loxon config. But it was restricted just to one mini server. You couldn't have it across multiple sites coming to one place. Um, trusts made that a little bit easier, um, but still required the Loxon app. And it wasn't as uh, uniform and seamless as we may have hoped. So that's where Exosphere solves that issue for you. So system schematics allows you to have one schematic and bring data from multiple mini servers across the internet, maybe on the other side of the world in one location. Um, so yeah, a great, great addition. So the licenses, how does this work? So we've got Essentials, Pro and Enterprise. With the Essentials, this is for, uh, this is free for Loxon partners who have attended a training course in the last 12 months. Um, we have, this is giving you the benefits, the, the core benefits like fleet management. So you can monitor all your mini servers, make sure everything's all good. Um, all of your config files can be backed up to Exosphere. So if you lose your computer, you damage it, or you have two computers that you work from, perhaps a laptop on site and a desktop PC in the office, instead of copying config files between different places, you can now host them in Exosphere, save them to Exosphere, and then when you get back, pick them up on a different computer. And this has got full integration with Loxon Config. So you can 
uh, log into your partner portal account in config like you have been able to for a few years now and access those config files. So it's a really great feature. And then we have mini server keychain. So mini server keychain then opens up the, it's essentially a password manager for your sites. So you only need to remember one password, which is your kind of master key for your mini server keychain. You can then store all of your credentials for your sites in Exosphere um, so that you can again access them on the fly, regardless of where you are. Of course, fully encrypted security doesn't need to be um, a worry of yours in this case. Everything's taken care of with the highest level of encryption, as always with Loxon. So a great addition for Loxon partners. Now, when it comes to schematics, charts and graphs, you can also use these in the essentials version, but I think you're limited to about one per uh, mini server. Uh, but you can still monitor the core things that are important to your site. Now, when it comes to Pro, this is where it comes a bit more detailed. So you've got automated backups, data analytics, and you can import historical statistics. So this is ideal for professional users, such as system integrators, uh, facilities managers who want to efficiently manage and optimize complex locks on installations with a mouthful. So these are, now this could be a customer of yours. It could be yourself. Now, Pro has a cost associated to it. So it's £284 per mini server for 10 years. Um, there are also other factors as well, like user licenses, which you can see there, which is £118 per user for 10 years. Um, but this is, I think, if you look at other solutions similar to Exosphere on the market, very, very much um, a cost-effective solution, shall we say, and much cheaper than the alternatives. Now, Enterprise and Pro are very similar in what they offer, but it's more designed for the larger infrastructures um, where you have the need for more reporting tools and data points, um, longer data retention as well. And that's what Enterprise offers. So it's a, it's a bit more expensive uh, and only really necessary for the larger scale um, projects. And there's, of course, a few add-ons as well. So if you need more storage for a workspace, then it's uh, £180 per year for 10 gigabytes. Or if you want the optional option for SMS alerts, so your mini server, well, sorry, Exosphere, can send you text messages, not just emails or phone calls, etc. It will send you a text message based on an alert. So you could say if a device goes offline, you get a text message straight away. So it's really there forefront on your lock screen. Um, and these, of course, are optional. That's pretty much Exosphere. So before we go on to the uh, energy meter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at Exosphere and show you uh, how to create a workspace, etc., cetera, um, and go through any questions we've got. Can third uh, questions we've got so far is can third party devices that report a battery level um, be monitored and notified in this way? So with uh, third party devices that report information into Loxon, whether that's through an API or whether that's through a analog input, etc., that's completely possible to monitor through Exosphere because like other function blocks, it's it's a function block that we can read information from. Um, if you've got statistics, etc., you can still bring them into Exosphere with no issue. Okay, so if we come out of this presentation for a moment, and we navigate to my browser. I have prepared a, um, so I'm gonna create a workspace. So as a, if a partner has attended training in the last 12 months, you should be able to see essentials. If you can't, um, then just reach out to support and we can help you out. But otherwise you will see pro and enterprise. So for pro, what you need to do is firstly create a workspace. Now, to create a workspace, you need a user license, not a mini server license. You need a user license. Um, and this will give you a hint that you need um, that the license will look like XO, Pro, then user, and then they've got some characters behind. When you first create your first workspace, your first uh, Exosphere workspace, it will also ask you for your company name. Um, so you can name it whatever you want, um, and uh, or probably your company name. Then with the workspace, if you are creating a workspace for your fleet of mini servers, I'd probably name the workspace your company name as well. 
But if you're creating a workspace, perhaps for one of your customers, then this is where you would name it unique to that project. Perhaps let's say it was Tesco. You would name the workspace Tesco. So I'm going to pop in my uh, license key and give it a workspace name. So I'm going to call it Locks on Product Conference uh, Webinar and pop in my license code and hit create. Brilliant. I've got license code invalid. This happened during the product conference as well. Good. Uh, oh, here we go. There we go. I got it wrong. Um, helps if I get the format properly. So there will be trial licenses available, which will last one month. So you can see the format there that I've set up for a trial license code. Um, so you would be able to follow that on as well. So I've created a workspace. This workspace now then is where I can start uploading my projects to. I can um, add my mini servers. I can create tasks. I could add team members. This is kind of the forefront of it. So to start off with, naturally, it makes sense, add a mini server. So to add a mini server, we uh, select the mini server pane over here, and then we've got the plus add mini server. You then need to type in a mini server serial number. So I am just going to grab uh, this serial number from the config file I've got open, and I'll just paste it in here. It doesn't matter whether it's got semicolons or not, it still will recognize it as a mini server. It's important as well that you have at least uh, the config version or mini server version of 15.0.5.10, um, and it's a current generation of mini server. So Gen 2, Compact, or mini server Go. Um, and it has to be using Remote Connect. It can't be using port forwarding. Uh, and it needs to be registered, of course, to use Remote Connect naturally anyway. So we'll click Add. It will then validate that this is a real mini server and I can press continue. I then have the option to assign a license. So if I want to assign a license, I can do now, or I can do it later on. I can select a workspace uh, structure here as well. So I'm gonna connect it to my workspace structure I've just created. Um, I can give it a name. I don't need to give it a name though, because it will automatically adopt it from my mini server itself once it connects. Um, and if I click assign now, I'll we'll enter more licenses because I haven't got any license. So if I enter a trial mini server license, which I have over here, let's see if this one plays ball. Here we go. I've added my trial license. So now I've got one trial license available or one license available. Assign now. There we go. It's assigned my license to that mini server and I can create and leave the wizard. So now I have the um, option to either manually configure the Exosphere connection uh, so I don't have to share credentials over the internet. Of course, they're fully encrypted. As soon as the authentication is done, they're deleted and never used again um, and nowhere to be found. Or if you don't want to share that information, you can copy these certificates into Locks on Config. Uh, so I'm going to close the setup wizard because I... I'm done now. Um, and here is my mini server. So I haven't uh, authenticated with it, and it seems to have haven't adopted my license that I gave to it. So perhaps I didn't assign it properly. So save. There we go. So my license code has now been added to this mini server. Um, I need to connect this mini server because I hadn't done it properly in a moment when I was uh, adding it. So reconnect. So this is where we authenticate. So I can either configure manually, like I said a moment ago, or I can uh, configure it automatically using credentials with the mini server. So to firstly, we have the user, which is used for Exosphere to grab information or execute tasks like backups, updates. But also if we want to get it to view graphs, et cetera, the Exo user needs to have access to those function blocks. So you could assign it to the rooms, et cetera. Um, if you don't assign any permissions, Exosphere can't do anything. The Exo user doesn't need to have credentials because the certificates are used for it. Um, so you don't need to worry about that. 
Then we have the password. Now, the reason why you need a user with full access to activate Accessphere is you're adding a network periphery item into the mini server. So you're essentially going via locks on config. And to do this, you need to have full access. And that is what these credentials are for. So I will just authenticate with my mini server uh, and press connect. So that connect has started. I believe I may have issues uh, because I haven't created the XO user, but we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, there we go. So the user couldn't be found on the mini server. So I haven't created the XO user. So if I go over to locks on config and connect to my mini server, let's create a user quickly and label it XO, manage permissions, so I want this user to have the update permission and backup permission. Um, and then, I mean, I haven't got anything on this config file, but I could tick all of the rooms to make sure that they can access it. One thing to bear in mind, ultimately, we can always be sure of our security, um, but this is a cloud-based platform. We never know what could happen. And that's why it's really important that critical things like access control are not given to Exosphere. So an easy way of doing this is where it says access schedules under the rooms, just change this to never. And then even if that function block was available, you could never do anything with it anyway. So that's a nice, quick and easy way of doing it. If you wanted to go that next extra level, instead of assigning rooms, just assign the individual functions or function blocks. But we don't need to worry about that because touch wood, nothing will ever happen. So save into the mini server. There we go. And we will then go back to Exosphere. I'll give it a quick refresh. And we will open up this mini server. Let's reconnect again. So Exo and add in my credentials, because of course I have to do this again because the Exo user didn't exist. So reconnect, the reconnection has restart uh, has started. Um, we've got a error, there we go. So the um, setup, is done. So we've now got access to access here. You can see the version on this mini server is 15.1.5.22. So this was an alpha version we released yesterday. I can see the last backup was never because I haven't backed this up. I set this mini server up about 40 minutes ago. Um, I can define automatic backups. I can include log files and statistics, or I can just execute the system file backup now. So I can back that mini server up. This will then run the backup. I can come back in a moment and we can download it if we want to. Message center, you can see here that I've got some uh, a system status message. So because the credentials are insecure that I'm using, um, potentially the Exosphere user, because it's got no credentials, which is fine. Um, we could always give it credentials if we wanted to. Um, we have now got the Exosphere Add in or add on if we, um, if you were interested, this is where it is. And this is also where you can see the certificate um, information as well. So if you did need to manually add it, you can do this here. Um, so this is here you go. You can see the backup is already done. If I want to download this, I can. If I want to name it, give it notes, I can also do this. If I come back out of here and go to mini server, I can go to settings. So this is global settings, which will affect all of my structure. I can create automatic backups. When these are done, define how long they're kept for, so the retention, the update times when automatic updates are done. This is settings within the mini server section. Now, if I go back to data, data is where I can define dashboard, system schematics, charts, and reports. So let's quickly set up a meter with an input and an intelligent room controller with an input. Let's make sure that we've got statistics enabled for these and we'll set them to never delete. And we want to take the recording interval. Let's for, in fact, actually, I don't need to set statistics because Exosphere automatically takes them for the function block and it's not taking them from statistics. The only need to have, you only need to have statistics enabled if it's kind of a mission critical function and you need historical data, let's say that your internet went down 
or there was some maintenance done on Exosphere, you don't need to have statistics done, uh, like set up, unless it's critical information and the historical information needs to be brought to Exosphere later. You don't need to worry about how it does it. It does it automatically for you. In my case, these function blocks have been created about two seconds ago, so I'm not going to have any historical information to bring across, but I can show you how to set it up. So I can go over here, I could create a chart, a new chart. Let's blame, blame this uh, webinar. And then in here, I can add information. So I can go to Navigator, select a mini server, go to Categories, Climate, Intelligent Room Controller. And I can say I want to get the current temperature. And I'm going to add as well Energy Meter, and I want to get the actual data from it. Here we go. Save. Uh, you can see no data is found at the moment because it's not reporting anything, um, but that's fine. We'll save this and come out of it. There's no data being found um, at the moment. Oh, we seem to have run into a temporary issue. Save. I think it's possibly because we've got no data to actually log. Um, but as this data is accumul accumulated, uh, of course, I can't actually mimic it because I haven't got a real system in place. Um, it would then display in this dashboard. I can then select to only show my intelligent room controller. I could only select to show my meter. And I have that flexibility. Now, let's go to tasks. I'll leave this for now. So for tasks, I can create two tasks in progress, see which tasks are done. Um, and I could create these just dynamically. So update um, Kieran's mini server. I could add this task. I could go into here. I could add a due date. So Tyrion doesn't need to update his mini server until next year. Um, and I can set the severity. It's low priority if I'm setting it in a year in advance. I can define which mini server it is. I can assign who's responsible for it within my team, and I can add a description. I can write comments as this has um, evolved as well. So I'm just going to click Save for now. Come out of here, and here you go. Now I can write comments. So um, Tyrion called to see the status of when this will happen. Comment, and this is now there. Um, and you can do this again amongst your team as well. Um, then we have projects. So this is where a config file is uploaded to Exosphere. So if we go across to blocks on config, press save as, upload to an Exosphere workspace, and I'm going to select blocks on product conference webinar, save as. You can now see at the top, I've got the blocks on product conference webinar. Although it says the same thing, I probably should have thought about that. But that's the workspace name, and then that's the name of my config file. And now, if I come back out of here, you can see already I've got my Locks on Product Conference webinar and uh, who it was created by, the size of it. You can see it's locked because I'm currently in that config file, so, so nobody else will be able to open that config file at the same time. I can assign this to a specific location, like in my workspace structure um, as well. I can download it so I can have it offline. I can up, uh, connect to my mini server immediately uh, from locks on config straight away from Exosphere as well, which is a really great tool. Finally, with team, we can click add, uh, define a locks on email address. I can assign their role, so whether they can create things, they can execute tasks, or they're just a viewer. And I can assign them a license. If you are a locks on partner and you are um, maintaining a workspace for a customer as a locks on partner you can be invited to a pro workspace or an enterprise workspace but you don't need to pay for a license your customer just needs to pay for a license and because you have a locks on partner account it will automatically allow you to join it to create that workspace you do need a license so that's where i'd recommend to create that workspace as the customer um, but for everything else you'll be able to join and still have the same level of permissions that you may expect. Spaces just allows me to look at my other spaces I've got and I'm, I'm a member of, so I can go to my personal one, other demonstration ones I've got, the UK location. 
different settings. So we've got the that the Loxon app is installed on this computer, so we can make sure that um, I can open up and connect to a mini server immediately uh, because it knows that the Loxon app is available. If the Loxon app wasn't on this device, it would just use the web interface. Uh, and then finally, admin. This is where I can add my license code. So if I've bought a license code and I just want to add them to Exosphere so they're there, I know where they are and nobody else can accidentally assign them, um, you can do this here. Just bear in mind that this is specific to a workspace, not Exosphere in general. So if I then went created a workspace for something else, I couldn't use a license which has already been added, even though it hasn't been added to a mini server or a user yet. So just bear that in mind. Um, but that's a very high level of Exosphere. We've got a QA. and a um, So Martin asks, will this uh, be available later? This, so I'm guessing the webinar. Uh, yes, we will um, be, uh, this, this webinar is recorded, so we'll upload it to YouTube later on. Okay, so that's Exosphere portion. Let's move on. So, the meters. Loads of people are integrating energy meters into, or, or meters in general, not just energy meters, into their uh, their configuration, they're into their projects. And nine times out of ten, there's something like Modbus or maybe Nbus, or you're communicating over a specific protocol. Each device may be slightly different, so you've got to read data sheets and register addresses. Now, of course, the Loxon library makes this massively easier, but if you wanted to add a meter and monitor it with Loxon, you need a Modbus extension, then you need that device. If you wanted to use it with the Modbus Air, you need an Airbase extension. So it can quite easily become quite complicated. The other factor is having a meter that does everything and it's easy to use. So that's exactly why the meter tree exists. So the meter tree becomes available in a three phase um, and um, a single phase variant, both rated up to 100 amps. The three phase variant can be used for three individual phases, or you can use it for three phase um, installation. Um, so it's great. So for example, let's say you wanted to monitor the grids, you wanted to monitor perhaps a heat pump and an immersion heater, you could use a three phase meter rather than three single phase meters. Um, your intervals are up to a second. So you can get information in up like almost less than a second. Um, so for mission critical installations where load shedding is important and balancing, the meter gives you that flexibility. Whereas with a Modbus alternative, although you can have one or two fast sensors, if that communication drops, you're then left in the dark. Whereas with uh, locks on tree, we know it's rock solid. There's nothing, no other external influences that could cause issues. It's down to one second. We know that we can then do load balancing and other important critical things within our installation with the meter tree. Of course, we have a display, so you can uh, take meter readings and power readings from it. Very low standby power. Uh, you can get statistics from it, of course, using locks on config. It's a small form factor. It's MID certified, which essentially just means it's sealed. Um, but you can use it for billing, um, which is also really important. Um, it fits perfectly in the locks on wall box. Um, tree interface. It's unidirectional, so you can... Uh, configure it so that the supply goes in the bottom and then your output through the top or vice versa. Um, it's a bi-directional meter, so you can put it on the grid if you do have solar as well. So it will re uh, read both ways. Um, and there's a sealable case as well. So it's you, know, you can secure it uh, where necessary. So what does it cost? It's £78 for the single phase variant and £195 for the three phase variant. And if you look at comparisons out there, it's pretty good going, uh, especially when considering you need usually other uh, extensions like Modbus, etc. The meter tree is a great price and it's a very easy product to integrate. Um, cool. Yes. Um, Adrian, you ask, will we get separate readings for both import and export? Yep. Yeah. So all of this information is given automatically, fully integrated with the meter function blocks. 
you will then get the specific readings for import, export, and the live power times as well. You aren't just getting your energy and your power. You can also get other information like frequency, voltage, and all the other inputs you would expect as well. Now, potentially one that we've all come for, audio. Audio is a great topic of ours at Loxon. And since 2020, when we released the audio server, it's become an even stronger and more popular topic. We also, around the time of the audio server, we also acquired Quadro, um, the Hi-Fi speaker manufacturer. And we've ever since been um, revolutionizing the audio industry, bringing out uh, new speakers um, and new features for all of your projects. Now with Master Client, we haven't stopped. With Master Client, this is where we saw an issue in the market where, especially for large scale installs, where you need multiple speakers or you need um, long cable runs, you were a little bit limited because with passive speakers, you had to bring your cables directly back to a central locations where your audio server and stereo extensions are. Now, Tree Turbo, you can somewhat increase this because you've got 150 meters of cable length. So you could put the stereo extension local to the speaker, um, although that then may, may mean you're using one stereo extension for one speaker versus for two. Um, but still a possibility. Now, with Master Client, this means that you can now increase your cable length from the source down to the last speaker to up to 750 meters. 750 meters is a very big number. So let's explain how that works. Tree Turbo is based on Ethernet. It's essentially Ethernet over two cores, which is why you may notice stereo extensions get an IP address on your network for such things like AirPlay 2 and Spotify Connect. Now, the benefit of this is we can then communicate with the speakers as well. So we can now have a master speaker, which has essentially got a stereo extension on the back, but it's a bit more complicated than this. It has Bluetooth as well. Um, and with this master speaker, this sits on Tree Turbo. So like we all, we all know with Tree Turbo, you've got a maximum of 10 devices, which could be a combination of master speakers or uh, stereo extensions. Um, in a free-form wiring topology, exactly like Tree. Now, with the client factor, you can have up to 20 speakers per master speaker. So you can, in total, have 10 masters, 20 clients per speaker, so 210 speakers in an installation where previously we were limited to 24 per audio server or mini server compact. Um, so a massive, massive difference. So for those larger scale projects in commercial sectors like restaurants, hospitals, offices, massive benefit. Um, so massive less, massively less cable. Um, and of course, our core products, uh, our core audio products get this feature. So the install speaker 7, the install speaker 10, the satellite speaker. And we've also now got a subwoofer. So an install subwoofer. Um, you could put it in the ceiling if you want to, but we'd recommend not doing so. Um, it's designed to go in the subwoofer box or you could put it in furniture and have it kind of integrated and away whilst delivering some amazing sound quality. This comes available like all of them in master client technology. And we'll look at some diagrams of how that looks in just a, a moment. Um, so the client communication, I've mentioned it's 150 meters uh, uh, for, for Tree Turbo. So how did I get to 750? I just plucked out of the sky. Um, no, it's you can have up to 30 meters between each client. So if we have 20 speakers and 30 meters between each, um, mar sorry, each client speaker, then we're going to be looking at a total of 600 meters from the master to the last client speaker. Um, this is, of course, for communication. It's all running at 24 volts, so keep in mind your voltage drop calculations as usual, um, but the communication go up to 600 meters. So really, really powerful. Um, client topology is strictly daisy chain or, or bus wiring. You don't uh, have the added benefit of the uh, free form wiring topology like you do with Tree and Tree Turbo. 
Um, but in those instances, you're likely having a different source anyway if you're going in opposite directions. So it's completely fine for clients. Now, for the overall system architecture, so 150 meters from the audio server or the mini server compact to your master, that's a total. So it's not to the first master and then down to the next. That is 150 in total. Um, you could have 10 runs of 150 meters going out in a star topology if you wanted to. Um, and then you have 30 meters between each client up to 20 clients, which is a total of 600 meters, um, which is really, really great. So of course, Bluetooth, uh, the core reason to why Bluetooth is there is for hotels. You can't have things like AirPlay or network-based network, network -based, uh, settings available on uh, your network because then you'd be streaming to everyone else's room and winding people up, and that will lead to angry customers. Bluetooth then enables you to connect to your own room. When you leave your hotel room, it can automatically forget your device. This is done by, let's say, you've got a Touch Pure Flex. You press the Touch Pure Flex Bluetooth icon. That enables Bluetooth pairing for whilst you're in that room. You connect, Bluetooth pairing then becomes inactive. You can play your music. When you check out, your device can be forgotten. So a real great feature. Um, I was going to put an Android phone here, but I'm still an Apple user at heart. So we kept those in um, just by an iPhone. Then, of course, sound suit. So how many people knew that you can't legally use streaming services such as Spotify and Apple Music in commercial settings. Potentially quite a few people didn't know that. And it's really important that we offer the correct solution to our customers. Um, of course, it's not down to you to dictate that the customer cannot use Spotify or Apple Music or whatever. You just have to give them their offerings. But now we support SoundSuit, which is kind of the, the leader for commercial licensed audio. Um, this allows more than just commercial license audio, but created playlists in different genres. You could schedule this as well. So I could say that uh, from 8 a.m. till 10 a.m., I could have perhaps some more chill, uh, relaxed music between 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. It could be more upbeat and then something else at the end of the day. Um, and this can be done through a schedule, which locks on automatically uh, picks up and of course it's fully integrated within the Loxon app, which is a real great addition. We've been running it in the office now for a good three, four weeks, and it's been amazing. Really good audio. Um sounds to have I think the the subscription is starting at £29 per month, which for commercially licensed audio is very good. Um, and then that's for one zone. If you want to then increase that, you can, and you can talk to SoundSuit about a custom package for your use case. Um, what else was I going to say about SoundSuit? I don't know. Oh, wait, no, yeah, I do know. They have a one-month free trial. You don't even have to put credit card information in there, which is great. So you can all test this at home now. Um, okay. So a topology or an example setup of master clients. So we've got here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight master speakers here. And that's because within these different offices and the meeting room, you may want to play different content, especially in the office and in the entrance as well. Let's say one of these offices was the CEO or the, the business owner, like you guys, I'm sure you want to be able to play your own music. But all of your, your colleagues or your, your team members, they have to listen and put up with whatever one person chooses. Um, so that's the benefit of having a master speaker in all of those areas. You could, if you wanted to, put client speakers in all of those areas and they would all play the same source. The benefit of having a client speaker is that client speakers, although they play the same source, their volume and play and pause state can be different. So you can control volume, play and pause on a client speaker, but the source is dictated from the master. So just bear that in mind when designing it. Of course, if you want to have them all on the same volume and play in poor state, of course you can. Uh, this is an example for a hospitality setting where you have 
a dining area, um, uh, the toilets, and then perhaps a more quieter dining area. So we could play different music where everywhere we've got a master speaker and then every client could play a slightly different volume. So in the toilets, you might want to play some comedy soundtrack or some bird sounds. Um, whereas in the restaurant, you may want to play uh, a more upbeat song um, in the main dining area. But in the secondary or the quieter dining area, it could be more of a relaxed soundtrack. In the bar area, it could be louder because, you know, vibes. But in the dining area, it could be quieter so you can actually talk to each other. Now, which speakers get this? So like I said, all of the Install 7 and 10 speaker, um, they are priced pretty well compared to just a passive speaker and the uh, stereo extension. One cool fact for you is um, Install 7, uh, yeah, the Install Speaker 7 is truly a 7-inch speaker you'll find that most other speaker manufacturers out there that make a seven inch ceiling speaker is usually between six and six and a half inches. So size really does matter. Seven inches is the size of the woofer, not the frame itself. But the six to six and a half inches, people are usually referring to the frame. So you'll find that even though at the same form factor, the install seven speaker can provide even more volume and quality of sound because it's got a bigger membrane. Um, it's not also a, uh, usually you'll have with uh, Loxon, you'll have the tweeter, sorry, not with Loxon, with most ceiling speakers, you'll have the tweeter and the woofer as separate entities, which means you've got the audio coming from two different locations. Whereas with a ceiling speaker, you want it all to come from one location so it can easily disperse and not be caused by any kind of clashes with the sound waves. The install speaker uh, 7 and the, the 10, all of the quadral speakers provide that. So you get a better, crisper sound quality and a bigger woofer. Then you have the, uh, yes, yeah, so you have the install 7, the, the 10, of course, client and master. And then you have the sub as well. So the sub is the same price as the install speaker 10, just doesn't have a tweeter. Um, you have a high pass filter built into the function block, which you, which you can enable and disable. If you want to ensure that the subwoofer is only playing the low tones, naturally it can't play the higher ones, but then remove the low tones from the other speakers in the room and only send them to the subwoofer, that's what the high pass filter does. And it caps the lows at 100 hertz, which you can't change. So that's the subwoofer will only get below 100 hertz. All the other speakers get above. 100 hertz if you want to disable this feature you can so the other speakers get the lower tones as well but if you've got a subwoofer give them all to the subwoofer and then of course the satellite speaker as well if you wanted to combine uh, a install sub 10 master with some passive speakers you've already got of course you can there's no problem with that you just need to take a bit of tree cable to your subwoofer from your audio server or mini server compact of course, naturally, with these speakers in commercial settings, you're ne not necessarily always going to have a suspended ceiling or a plasterboard ceiling. So you can't use one of our surface mount back boxes. So that's why we brought out our surface mount boxes. So for both the install speaker 7 and the install speaker 10. Um, and you've got the cable grommets there for the cable to come out of. And then we have the box for the install sub. So you can put these in the... Um, in furniture or in the corner of the room, it's up to you. Worth noting that the install speaker sub um, comes with a black grill, like you can see here, um, whereas the other speakers come with a white grill. If you were to buy a surface box, which is black, you get a black grill with the box, so you don't need to worry about spraying it separately. Um, and you can, of course, screw it to the box as well. Now, because we're really generous, you get an extra 10% on all of the new products that we've announced um, last Monday. You have until June 12th at 11 p.m. to redeem this. So you don't need to worry about voucher codes or anything like this. It's automatically added at checkout. You just add the devices. There's no restriction to how many you have. You can put 100 subwoofers in your living room if you wanted to. Um, just don't send any loved ones my way when you get into trouble. 
Um, and of course, this is also including excess fear licenses. So you get an extra 10% off to your normal partner discount. If you're a gold platinum or flagship partner, check your partner portal. You might have some extra discount in there, um, but I won't spoil the fun. You can go and have a look. Um, but yeah, definitely worth taking advantage of the extra 10%. Questions? Any questions? So Martin, on Exosphere, can we grant access to locks on support for support? Yeah, of course. If you wanted to, you'd have to add us as an individual user if you wanted, um, but we can't automatically see it. Um, if you wanted to have us help you out, we're more than happy to. Of course, we could also use TeamViewer as well. Um, also asked, do we have any pricing deals with SoundSuit? Uh, no, as far as I'm aware, we don't have any specific pricing deals, just uh, still separate entities. You'd need to deal with uh, licenses and subscriptions with them. Um, what else have we got here? Cameras in the Loxon app on desktop. Looks like it's working. Can you confirm if it's been fixed? I believe some adjustments have been made, but the one thing with cameras is because every camera has got a slightly different parameters required, if we change one thing, it's got to be changed for all of them. So our general recommendation would be if you must put the camera in there, just put one type. If you, um, so we don't have to change all the parameters. If not, you could use the app function block to link the customer directly to the um, CCTV app on their device. So although they started in the Loxon app, it's just taking them to that CCTV app, which was designed for the purpose of viewing those cameras. Um, Loxon probably not going to bring out any CCTV cameras, so it's probably best to stick with them. Cool. Any other questions? You're welcome to submit them now. Um, the next conference is already planned for the end of um, the next year. But if you want to submit your references, you definitely can. Um, in just general, as you submit a reference in your partner portal, and then if you uh, end up coming to the next conference and you want to submit it for an award, of course you can, but submit them now. Um, but otherwise, that is thank you from me. Um, it was great to have you all in attendance. Don't forget that 10% voucher. If you have any questions that you haven't had the opportunity to ask today, just give me a call tomorrow or send me an email and I'll be happy to help out. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much.